recently given an opportunity to question some leading economists about the issues they'll be facing next year on Capitol Hill. They gathered at a conference hosted by Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is an hour 40 minutes. I'm Bill Purcell, the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. As uh, the people in this room know, the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Kennedy School have been hosting this program for newly elected members of Congress since 1972. More than 600 members of Congress uh, have been participants in this program, and today we have present in this room uh, 40 women and men, uh, Democrats and Republicans, newly elected to Congress from all across this country. Uh, it offers congressmen and congresswomen their first opportunity to spend time with their colleagues from both political parties and to talk and think about the issues that are directly in front of them and America. Uh, this morning's discussion is entitled, Understanding the Economic Crisis. Leading our panel of Harvard experts is the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, David Elwood, recognized as one of this nation's leading scholars on poverty and welfare. Dean Elwood's work has been credited with significantly influencing public policy in the United States and abroad. He's a labor economist. His most recent uh, research focuses on the changing structure of American families. It's my privilege to welcome Dean David Elwood. Yes, thank you. We are here this morning to talk about the obvious and most interesting and important set of issues that will confront all of you. Uh, in the first months and I'm afraid the first years of your terms in Congress. We're very fortunate today to have a very, very distinguished panel. We have uh, three former members of the Council of Economic Advisors and, and the person that is currently leading the congressional oversight of the uh, panel, that, the, the congressional oversight panel of what's going on in terms of the emergency reaction. So let me briefly introduce each of the folks. Um, then they will each talk uh, for about 10 minutes and then we hopefully will have a very free-flowing and open discussion. But uh, it's, it is obviously a time of enormous turmoil and uncertainty, and so we're going to do our best to provide uh, some straightforward analysis of it. The first speaker today is the person directly on my right, uh, Jim, Jim, uh, Jeff Frankel. He is the James Harpell Professor of Capital Formation here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he directs a program on international finance and macroeconomics at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is also a member of the Business Cycle Dating Committee. Uh, you may have heard a couple of days ago they declared we've been in a recession for about a year at the same time that he claims it's not causal. All stock markets around the world fell by 7 percent, so he's responsible for decline in the total wealth of the world by 7 percent. Uh, uh, from 1996 to 1999, uh, he was a member of President Clinton's Council on Economic Advisors, and his responsibilities there uh, involved international economics, macro, and the environment. Uh, he has been, uh, had a past appointment to the Federal Reserve at the, at the uh, International Monetary Fund and many other such places. Uh, let me uh, next turn to Greg Mankiw uh, further on his right. He's a professor of economics. Uh, he, he's a professor in the economics department here at Harvard. Um, he literally wrote the book. Uh, Many, maybe most, undergraduates nowadays who, when they go in and take an introductory course in economics, will use <coughs> principles of economics, and that's a book that uh, Greg has written. This is, of course, it's sold over a million copies. It's been translated into 20 different languages. He's also written one of the, the premier intermediate uh, textbooks on macroeconomics. I was asking him how much it's being revised right at this moment. Uh, it is a remarkable time. He's a prolific writer himself. His research uh, is on everything from price adjustment and consumer behavior, financial markets. And he served from 2003 to 2005 as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Um, he, too, has been uh, affiliated with many institutions ranging from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to the Congressional Budget Office. Elizabeth Warren, on my left, is the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She teaches a contract law, bankruptcy, and commercial law, of course, an issue that suddenly is one of the most popular courses in all of Harvard, though she's always been one of the greatest teachers. Uh, she's certainly written frequently and testifies uh, often on issues ranging from credit laws to personal bankruptcy. She's one of her main contributions and the focus of much of her work has been fo what's been happening to the middle class. And indeed, uh, uh, she's uh, written numerous books, but for example, one is The Two-Income Trap, Why Middle-Class Mothers and Fathers Are Going Broke. 
Uh, she's a member of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's um, Committee on uh, Economic Inclusion. But most importantly, uh, she, on November 14th of this year, was selected to chair the Congressional Oversight Panel on the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was, said, was quoted as saying, the panel will provide independent and ongoing oversight to ensure that the economic recovery program is managed with full transparency and strict accountability. So it's very useful to have Elizabeth here with us today. So she's often, she's perennially recognized as one of the 50 most influential women attorneys and the like. Finally, Robert Lawrence on my far left is the Albert L. Williams Professor of International Trade and Investment here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, he's also involved in a number of other places like the National Econo Bureau of Economic Research and the like. He was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors between 1998 and 2000 under President Clinton. His research is focused on trade policy. Uh, he currently serves as the faculty chair of the Practice of Trade Co Policy Executive Program at Harvard Kennedy School, which often brings trade ministers from around the world to talk and look and explore. Uh, he's been on advisory boards at the Congressional Budget Office, Overseas Development Council, and so on. He, too, is the author of many books and articles, such as Crimes and Punishments, Retaliation Under uh, WTO, Regionalism and Multilateralism, and the like. So each of these folks has uh, much to offer. And what I'm going to first ask is uh, 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 Professor Frankel and Professor Mankiw to give us a little bit of a sense of how we got where we're at uh, and begin to touch on where we're headed and what we're trying to do. And then I'll turn it over to, to uh, uh, Professor Warren and, and Professor Lawrence to, to give us some additional insights uh, on where we're, where we're heading, what's been going on. So let me start with Jeff Frankel. Now, uh, I am, you may watch me passing notes. I'm going to be a strict timekeeper here. Uh, Jeff is, uh, has some slides here, and um, he's known for his slides. I will say no more. Uh, Jeff? <coughs> Well, thank you, Dean Elwood. I'm not sure whether you mean I'm known for the, the, the quality of my slides or the quantity, uh, but in this case, I have kept it to uh, three slides. Uh, I hope to, uh, as is but my... wait till you see those slides. <laughs> ...to try to uh, set the stage uh, for this panel by uh, uh, reminding uh, us of uh, where we are in the economic crisis and try to say something about how we got that way, although uh, nobody uh, thoroughly understands uh, the economic crisis, despite the title uh, of, the, of the session. Um, the, uh, just uh, to remind you, the subprime mortgage crisis hit in uh, the summer of 2007. And for quite a while, the hope was that it could be, it would be contained, was the, the words that often came reassuringly from the, the Federal Reserve and elsewhere. Well, that turned out uh, not to be the case. And uh, various uh, indicators of economic activity started to go into uh, decline. Uh, the one that is sort of most precise is uh, payroll employment, uh, which is illustrated in this graph. The top graph is the total labor force. The middle graph is, uh, is employment, number of jobs. And the bottom graph is the unemployment rate. Payroll employment peaked in December 2007, and since then we have lost about 1.2 million jobs. The unemployment rate in the most recent month available was 6.5% in October. That would be on the, on the payroll basis and has uh, risen uh, quite a bit from uh, uh, over, over the last year. By the way, tomorrow is uh, the day, the first Friday of the month, is when the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases the uh, numbers for uh, November, and uh, we'll see what those are. Well, uh, as, uh, as Dean Elwood mentioned, uh, I'm a member of the NBR Business Cycle Dating committee, and on a Monday we made the declaration that, uh, oops, that the recession had started December 2007. That should be uh, one year uh, old. Uh, may maybe a Freudian slip because most people's reaction is, what, only now? A year later you're uh, announcing it, um, uh, maybe implying that we took too long. But on the other hand, uh, it, it, maybe, we took, uh, maybe we did it too soon because many people think the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative uh, growth, and we haven't had that yet. But uh, the, the definition, the, the, we have some official status, uh, is what the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee says it is for uh, a recession. And, and we look at a variety of indicators. Greg Mankiw was on this committee for uh, maybe eight years, but it's one of those committees that's good to be on when, when, during an expansion because it never met. Uh, that was uh, during the longest uh, uh, expansion in, uh, in American history uh, in the, uh, in the 19. Uh, 90s. Anyway, the fact that the recession started in December 2007 means that it is already longer than the preceding two recessions, which both were eight months in length. 
it means that it is also already longer than the average post-war recession, which is 10 months in length. length. Now, the record is 16 months, which is uh, the two most severe recessions so far, 81, 82, and uh, 70, 1974. Everybody's forecast, and I'm now not speaking uh, as a member of this committee, uh, the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee, but if you look at the forecast of the Federal Reserve or the IMF or the private forecasters, pretty much everybody expects uh, the, the recession to continue at least until the middle of 2009, which would mean that it will be uh, the longest post-war recession. So by that measure, uh, uh, worst, uh, worst recession. Nowhere near the Great Depression. That, that's, uh, let me just uh, put that one aside. Okay, how did we get here? Well, this is my attempt uh, to uh, put uh, a, a, just about everything, I had to leave some things out, into one slide. And, and this is my, my last slide, uh, so you'll be relieved uh, to hear. So at the top, I have uh, five uh, relatively fundamental causes uh, or origins, and I welcome uh, amendments or corrections from my fellow panelists. Uh, one problem is, at least in retrospect, monetary policy was too easy. Uh, roughly between 2003 and 2005. There was this period when interest rates were uh, rock bottom. And it's, this is much easier to say in retrospect. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily give Alan Greenspan, uh, who was chairman of the Fed at the time, too hard a time on, uh, on this, given what was known at the time. And there's areas other than monetary policy where I think he made, made, uh, made worse mistakes. But in, in retrospect, it was too easy, and it gave rise. Money went out of uh, Treasury bills and because they didn't pay much interest, and they went into everything else, housing stocks, commodities, emerging markets, and so on. Um, second, the financial markets way underestimated risk in the years 2004, 2005, 2006. And I have in mind precise, uh, precise things that go into formulas when the people in the financial markets, the hot shot traders, trade uh, options and, uh, and uh, junk bonds and all the rest. They have, they have models that tell them what the degree of risk is. And for technical reasons that I won't go into, well, basically because they were just looking backwards and things had been calm in the past. And so they way underestimated risk when I think uh, one could have reasonably said there's a number of very great uncertainties in the horizon, on the horizon, which have to do with some of these other factors. Number three is failures of corporate governance, and it's here where maybe some reforms uh, over time would be appropriate. Uh, one would be executive compensation and the heavy use of uh, options to uh, 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 compensate uh, top executives, which may give them an incentive to, uh, to uh, take, take more risk than we want. We like risk taking, but too much, uh, and particularly with regard to short-term profits and disregarding uh, longer-term uh, uh, health. The fourth fundamental factor has been going on for a long time, American households save too little. Uh, by international standards, saving rate is very low, and they borrow too much. And during the housing boom, they kept uh, uh, they figured, well, I've got a lot of uh, wealth in my house, and so they consumed a lot, and they even borrowed against the house, uh, used the used their their house as an ATM in the in the in the cliche. Um, and a lot of people took out uh, mortgages that they couldn't really afford uh, in the longer term, unless housing prices continued to go up at a very rapid rate, which was. I, uh, most of us think we are never in, uh, was never in the cards. The fifth fundamental uh, problem is uh, federal budget deficits, which, uh, in my view, the, uh, we got set on a path in 2001 through the tax cuts that were passed in 2001 and 2003, and the path of spending, which was uh, triple the rate of growth of spending uh, of the uh, preceding administration, we got set on a long-term path of fiscal irresponsibility. That's, that would be my interpretation. Uh, others are welcome to give uh, different interpretations. All right, now we go down to the next level of, uh, of uh, causality, excessive leverage in financial institutions. and. Uh, that's that uh, uh, blue uh, box. And uh, some of this is, uh, is, is perhaps structural and uh, could be addressed by, uh, by, by reform, uh, higher uh, capital requirements for uh, financial institutions. And the problem is not so much with banks as with other uh, institutions that were basically doing the jobs of, of banks but not formally uh, uh, regulated uh, as banks. In the case of banks, we have re minimum requirements uh, for uh, uh, reserves that you have to hold and uh, capital adequacy and all that. Although even there, 
uh, one of the things, reforms we might need is at the international level. Uh, in Basel, Switzerland, the uh, central bankers meet, and there's an agreement called Basel II, where they tried to improve the system by setting uh, for inter big international banks uh, capital adequacy. And I think, in retrospect, uh, those uh, methods of, uh, of setting those uh, uh, lever levels of uh, uh, leverage and, and, and the capital requirements need to be adjusted. Basically, they were too, too pro-cyclical. And I see all three of those uh, factors, the monetary policy, the underestimation of risk, and the failures of, the, of corporate governance, and particularly in the regulation in the financial sector, is feeding in to excessive leverage in financial institutions. Well, then we got the stock market bubble, and we got the housing uh, bubble. Uh, the stock market bubble really came in two stages, the late 90s and then, uh, and then a renewed one um, in, uh, uh, up until a year ago. And uh, the housing bubble uh, grew slowly and, uh, and uh, reached its uh, peak at uh, maybe 2005, 2006. And in, uh, in line with the arrows I've shown there, I, I am trying uh, largely to attribute those bubbles to the factors that I have already named. Well, where there's a bubble, there's usually a crash. Uh, following. And uh, we've had both the stock market crash and the uh, housing uh, crash, and those are the, uh, th those are the black uh, explosions there, indicating uh, that uh, there's some, uh, some, some, <coughs> some problem. The first stock market decline was in uh, the year 2000, but then it recovered uh, to its previous peak, and, and of course we've seen new, new crashes. Uh, new, uh, the stock market has fallen by roughly half over the last few weeks. And, and by the way, it's, it's true that world market, uh, stock market capitalization fell 7% on the day that, that the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee declared the recession. But I looked at the pattern during the course of the day, and it, I don't think it's our fault because it, it, it didn't happen within the two hours after the announcement. Uh, it, it happened in a different, different part of the day. Um, and of course, we weren't telling people anything that they didn't already know. Well, the, to, the combination of the housing crash and the stock market crash, I think, caused the financial crisis, together with the fact that uh, financial institutions were so highly levered that they didn't have a margin of error. Uh, and so uh, when the assets they held uh, lost value, they had to retrench uh, very rapidly. And uh, the financial crisis I have dated uh, from uh, mid-2007, it's obviously still continuing, but I think we've moved into a new uh, phase, uh, the recession which uh, uh, now formally uh, started at the very end of 2007. It's almost a, a year old, and, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, predicting here, uh, probably uncontroversially, that it'll continue into 2009. It'll be the recession of 2008 to 2009, essentially. In addition to the financial crisis, there were some other contributing uh, factors. I have the uh, oil price uh, spike off to the left there of 2007 and 2008. Now, uh, it, it's hard to remember that it was only two or three months ago that the prices of oil and other uh, agricultural commodities and mineral commodities were at, in many cases, all-time highs across, across the board of almost all commodities, and that that was uh, contributing, I think, to the, uh, to the slowdown. As a result of the global recession, uh, probably, uh, the, that's the reason, uh, the prices of oil and other commodities have fallen a lot over the last few months. And if you've got very good eyesight, you'll see that I have uh, a few contributing causes to the oil price spike in the first place. Rapid growth in China and other East Asian countries and the world in the aggregate, so that increased demand for oil. Uh, plus, I have uh, political instability uh, in, the, in the Persian Gulf and among other oil uh, exporters. So. Um, there's some other factors off to the right there, but that's really for the longer term, which is a distinct set of problems in the current recession. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, uh, that turned out to be a great chart, so thank you. Uh, next, I want to turn it over to Greg Mankiw. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, let me start by uh, congratulating the newly uh, elected members of Congress and thanking you for the service to the, to the country that you'll be doing in the next uh, few years. Uh, talking about the uh, economic and financial crisis is uh, particularly difficult because it's one of those areas where economists do not uh, see with this, see the world through a single uh, lens. There's lots of issues, by the way, that economists do agree on. If you get a bunch of economists in the room to talk about international trade, 80 or 90 percent of them will be free traders. If you get them in the room to talk about global climate change, 80 or 90 percent, I'll tell you, we should put on a carbon tax. But if you get a bunch of economists in the room to uh, talk about what we should do in the face of a uh, uh, economic crisis like we're facing now in the macro economy, you're not going to get a consensus. You may get actually more opinions than you have economists. Uh, so, um, so I think it's very hard to 
for, for anyone uh, in your shoes to figure out you know, what's the right thing uh, to do. It, a simpler, let me give, I, 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 just, I agree with a lot of what Jeff said about the causes of this, not all of it, but most of it. But let me sort of try to boil much of it down to a much simpler narrative. What happened in the, in the past uh, decade or so was that lots of financial institutions made a bet that housing prices nationwide would not fall by 20 percent. Now, you ask why did they make such a bet? Well, it's in large part because housing prices never had fallen nationwide by 20 percent. Well, it's not quite true. They had in the 1930s, but that was a long time ago. And it happened in Japan in the 1990s. That's far away. So if you don't look too far in the past or too far away geographically, it's just impossible for housing prices to fall. So they made the bet they wouldn't. They did. And they ended up losing lots of money. Uh, having lost lots of money, they then found themselves with much too little capital to uh, uh, continue their main goal and objective in the uh, economy of, of moving resources between savers and uh, borrowers. And the whole process of financial intermediation broke down. Things are made all the worse. Not only they, they lost lots of money, it wasn't sure exactly who lost the money. It wasn't sure wh where the bodies were buried. And the tremendous uncertainty about how this would all uh, end, I think, it, it contributed to a sense of panic and, 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 a, and a great loss of confidence, which in turn affected not only housing prices, but also stock prices. So the question is, what do we do now? I think there's sort of a cons consensus among most economists, although probably not all, that, that we should basically look at the current uh, situation through the lens of, of a particular theory proposed by John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s. And the basic theory was that we have recessions and depressions when there is in insufficient aggregate demand. Or to put simply, people just aren't spending enough to keep people fully employed. Well, economists typically divide the demand for goods and services into four categories. And if you look at each of those different components of gross domestic product, it's hard to find demand coming from anywhere. So the first component, the 70% of the economy, is consumption. It's very hard to see uh, households picking up the slack for demand going forward. As, as Jeff correctly pointed out, Americans typically have uh, a a uh, low uh, saving rate, and many economists have for a long time talked about how households should save more and we should do things to try to encourage saving. Uh, this may not be the best time to, to do that, though, because the problem is insufficient demand and getting people to save rather than spend is only going to con contribute to the uh, economic downturn. And if you look at what households are facing, it's, it, the, the idea that they're going to start s consuming a lot more and then over the next uh, six months or a year is, is pretty implausible. People are opening up their, their 401k statements and seeing they're a lot poorer than they were a year ago, and they're looking at the house value and deciding that that home equity line that they could use to finance the next vacation is not going to uh, go as far as it, as it did. Consumer confidence is very close to an all-time low uh, by many of the, sur the surveys that people do. So it's very hard to see that, cons that consumption is going to pick up much of the demand slack going forward. Uh, investment is also weak. In particular, residential investment has fallen off because basically what's going on in the housing market, uh, m measures of residential investment are down by more than 40 percent over the past few years. Uh, business investment is also not looking so good because financing is hard to come by. Businesses are looking at their stock price saying, hmm, it's going to be hard to raise money in equity markets. They're looking at, to their bank and saying, huh, it's not looking so good to getting ba bank financing. They're looking at corporate bond yields, and, and they, those look pretty uh, unattractive too. So it's unlikely that investment is going to pick up the slack. Six months ago, the story was that uh, foreigners would pick up the slack. The, f the, the third component of, of GDP that I'll talk about is net exports. And for a while, it looked like the uh, dollar was depreciating, making U.S. goods uh, um, cheaper abroad, and net exports were booming. And it looked like that, that was, that was going to save the day. You know, we, consumers would stop spending here, and maybe investment would fall off, but then our net exports would pick up, and that would save us from a deep downturn. Ironically, as the crisis in the United States has spread to the rest of the world, investors have looked for a safe haven. That safe haven is the United States, in many cases. Uh, and so capital has been flowing back to the United States. It's caused the dollar to appreciate in the past six months, which means our goods are more expensive abroad. And so net, it's hard to see over the um, next uh, six months or a year that net exports are going to be a source of demand. And that leaves the fourth component of, of, of gross domestic product, which is government purchases. And a lot of people are therefore looking to the government as being the demander of last resort, as being a person the, the institution to pick up the slack and start demanding goods and services when nobody else wants them. And I'll get to back to the pros and cons of that in a minute. Okay, so how are we going to fix this problem that we're, we're heading into this, this deep downturn? Well, there's uh, three uh, basic 
things we need to think about. One is fixing the financial system. The second is monetary policy, and the third is fiscal policy. So let me say a few words about each of those. Uh, the Treasury has been coming up with this, the plan, as you've been reading the newspaper, to try to sort of fix the financial system. To, to an outsider, it looks like they're flailing and changing course all the time. I actually don't blame them for that in the sense that it's deeply complicated what's going on. We're not completely sure what's going on. And sometimes experimentation and, fla and flailing is the, is the best you can do. This is the, you know, plan A was to buy ta toxic assets from the bank. They, switch, they switched on the, on the encouragement of many economists to use the uh, TARP money to recapitalize the banks uh, uh, through, uh, through ec equity injections to basically ma make, the, uh, make up for the losses that the banks had suffered. This is not losing money for the taxpayer because we were getting an ownership stake. It's more of an investment for the taxpayer. But the goal is not to, not to be an, an, an investor, but really to get the financial system working again. And, to, and now it looks like they're thinking about making loans directly. The discussion in today's paper about of mortgages and working through the, the now nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, is, to, is to provide mortgages directly. And one thing that's been very troublesome is that while interest rates on government bonds have been coming down, mortgage rates have not been coming down. And the, the, uh, the Treasury is, is looking at ways at dealing with that. Monetary policy is, I think really monetary policy is the first line of defense in, in dealing with global economic downturn. Uh, the good news about monetary policy is that the guy running it, Ben Bernanke, is as good as it gets. I think there's a widespread consensus among professional economists that Ben Bernanke is the right man for that job at this time. He, he has tremendously high uh, um, esteem uh, among academic economists, wh which is where he, Ben comes from. And I think that's true of, of, of economists both affiliated with the Republican Party like myself and, and, and economists associated with the, the Democratic Party. Ben has just a very good reputation. The bad news, of course, is that he's as clueless as the rest of us about what the re best thing to do is. Um, uh, but, he's, but he's also um, been very creative in what he's been doing. Uh, the, f the fear about monetary policy in the current environment is that it looks like it's starting to run out of ammunition. That is, the traditional tool for fighting recession is the cutting interest rates. And the particular interest rate they target is something called the federal funds rate, which is an uh, interest rate uh, that, uh, that banks loan money to each other at the overnight rate. That's pretty close to zero, which is the lower bound for interest rates. Uh, and uh, people start fearing that you know, monetary policy may be, uh, lose its power in that environment. But Ben has actually written, even before this, uh, this environment, he's, he's written papers and given speeches about creative ways to uh, stimulate the economy and deal with, this, the, with monetary policy when you're facing this lower bound of zero. Uh, and now he's, he's implementing a lot of the ideas that he's had previously. So it involves things like um, getting longer term interest rates down. He's even talked about the Fed. Uh, buying mortgage uh, instruments. Uh, and uh, I think what's very clear is that he's willing to act very creatively, and he will continue to act very creatively in, in to get monetary policy uh, fight, fighting this uh, global economic downturn. The third tool is uh, fiscal policy, uh, which is presumably where you guys uh, come in uh, in very short order as soon as you uh, take, 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 take your new jobs. There's two ba basic textbook answers for how fiscal policy can prop up aggregate demand. Uh, there's increased government spending or cut taxes. Uh, and uh, one of the issues you're going to be facing is to what extent you want to do one and to what extent do you want to do the other. Uh, the textbook answer, including the one that you'll find if you open up my textbook, is that for stimulating the demand for goods and services, you actually get more bang for your buck uh, by an increase in government spending than you will for a, the same dollar figure for a tax cut. That is sort of the textbook answer, and you'll hear that from a lot of economists. I don't think it's actually clear whether that's completely uh, true, by the way, because while that's the, the model, that's the answer that comes out of the textbook theories that we, we teach, uh, there's some evidence that, to the contrary. There's a paper written just a few years ago by Olivier Blanchard, who's now uh, chief uh, economist at the IMF. He wrote, wrote that when he was back at professor at MIT. And what Blanchard finds is that a higher government spending tends to crowd out more investment. Um, whereas tax cuts tend to uh, stimulate more private investment. And that's not something you, that difference is not something you'd expect from textbook Keynesian theory, but it does seem to be true in the data. Uh, and similarly, some re recent research building on the Blanchard research by Harold Ulig at the uh, University of Chicago also finds that sort of tax cuts are more stimulatory than spending increases. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a very interesting debate about to what extent you want to do on the spending side and to what extent you want to do on the tax side. Uh, and I don't think the economics profession has a very clear answer uh, on that question. Now, the big fl fly in the ointment about fiscal policy is the long-run fiscal outlook. We have the big problem you're going to face longer term, not over the next two years, but over the next um, 10 or 20 years, has to do with the aging of the population. Uh, as the baby boom generation retires, 
uh, and there are more people drawing on Social Security and Medicare, and as health care costs continue to increase, the gap between government spending and tax revenue is going to grow larger and larger. Uh, anything you do in the short run to stimulate the economy is probably going to involve increases in government debt which is going to make dealing with a longer-term fiscal problem of the aging of the population and the Social Security and Medicare uh, unfunded liabilities even harder. So that is, in some sense, the, uh, the big uh, uh, fly in the ointment. That's why my own view is that monetary policy is in the front line here rather than fiscal policy, in terms of getting the economy out of the short-run uh, downturn, but fiscal policy may have a, uh, a, a, a role to play as well. In, in my last minute, let me sort of talk about how bad things are going to get. Um, uh, like Jeff, I'm not expecting a great, another Great Depression. Uh, but I will I just want to just to, to tell you about, about one very quick study. There was a study written about five years ago, um, maybe ten years ago now, uh, 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 by a prof professor uh, at Yale. And what they found was that in the 1930s, as, as the Great Depression was unfolding, people did not expect a Great Depression to unfold. It was completely un un unfor un unforecast at the time. When they were sitting on panels like this, people were saying it's not going to be like another Great Depression. What's worse is that that professor said, what if, what if we had the modern tools of econ economics to forecasting then? So we had that, their data, but our modern tools. Could we have forecast the Great Depression? And the answer is, no, we could not. So I'm not, for, I'm not forecasting another Great Depression. We should take that with, another, with a very large grain of salt. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for that uplifting uh, uh, <laughs> conclusion. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. So, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I hope I get a chance to meet all of you. Um, I, I want to start back with Jeffrey's chart. And Jeffrey had a little chart in there that said, he said there were five things that got this started. And he had one called Saving Too Little, Borrowing Too Much. And I want to talk about that for just a couple of seconds. You know, this is not like um, 100 million American families woke up and said, I know, let's quit saving and let's go borrow. Um, what happened is there's been an enormous shift in the economics of the middle class over one generation. So that basically, I'm going to do the really quick sketch of this and we can all go back. What we've had is we've had flat incomes for fully employed males. A uh, fully employed male uh, uh, this year makes about $800 less in inflation adjusted dollars than a fully employed male was making in the early 1970s. Um, and what we've also had is rising core expenses. Expense, the, the family budget has actually shifted so that uh, families in inflation adjusted dollars over this 30 year arc are spending less on food, uh, less on clothing, less on appliances, uh, uh, less on furniture. Uh, they're spending more on electronics, but it adds up to about $330. Nobody went broke over this, uh, more on electronics. Uh, it's not consumption goods. Where the real rises have been, and all across this arc, has been in housing, in health care, in child care, in transportation, and taxes because they have two people in the workforce when you add up the total number of dollars that families are spending. So we've got families with flat incomes, rising core expenses, and so what have they done? The average one-income family back in the 1970s was putting away, think about this, 10% of their take-home pay they were putting away in savings. Uh, the median American family today has two people in the workforce, and what have they been putting away in savings for the last four years? Zero. They put away effectively, statistically speaking, nothing. So they put a second worker into the workforce. They spent everything that she brought to the table. They spent everything they used to spend in savings, right? They, they just stopped doing that and kept sending it out the door. And the third part, they went into debt. And they didn't go into debt just to get uh, spa bathrooms and uh, granite countertops. They went into, into debt to buy the median American family, moved from 5.8 rooms to 6.1 rooms. They picked up either a third bedroom or a second bathroom, but not both. And they, they borrowed lots of money to do it. And then let's just be clear, in order to meet the rest of their expenses, they hit the credit cards. They hit the credit cards, they finance more on the cars, they hit payday loans, every way you had to go. So these families now, we have 50 million American families today who cannot pay off their credit card bills. On average, they owe about two months of income. And they're paying interest on that income. 
uh, paying interest on that outstanding bill. The average family, kind of back of the envelope calculation, is probably spending somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1,650 a year just on interest and fees. A whole new expense that's not even accounted for when we talk about family expenses. Next time you look at uh, uh, the consumer price index, remind yourself they assume you paid cash and that you have no credit expenses <coughs> outstanding. Okay, so that's where the American family stands. The question then becomes, how do we get into this crisis? And, and because I've been instructed to, I'm going to kind of short circuit here to try to use it as a way to talk about three things that we might want to be thinking about over the next year or two for changes that might be helpful. And the first I want to talk about is I want to talk about consumer financial products, because in my view, that is where this crisis started. This crisis started in part back in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, when we kicked out a law that we had had um, since colonial times, and that was usury. Uh, we'd had usury caps all across the United States. They predate the American Constitution. We had them in every state in one form or another. And then through uh, the interpretation of a banking law that had been passed in the post-Civil War era, uh, in 1979, the United States Supreme Court had to decide what some obscure language meant. I'll take you through it if you want. But the bottom line was it permitted banks to set up shop in one state with a very high usury cap and then export their credit cards, uh, in this particular case, all around the country and use that home state's uh, usury rate. As a consequence, um, the CEO of one of the very large banks went to South Dakota and said, uh, would you be interested in raising your usury cap? I can promise you 700 new jobs. And uh, uh, they did and they did. If you've ever wondered why your Citibank bill is mailed back to South Dakota, there's the answer. And the consequence is South Carolina and Oklahoma and California lost the ability to control interest rates within their jurisdictions. Uh, home mortgages soon followed with a Congressional Act in the 1980s, no public debate. Now the consequence of this, in a high inflationary period immediately in the 1980s, had very small consequence. But over time, it began to change how consumer lending looked. Consumer lending had frankly been a pretty pokey business. Uh, you made modest profits, but they were quite reliable. That's what the mortgage industry looked like. Uh, the default rates on mortgages, you're absolutely right, was about 1%. Of course, back in the 1970s, the median first-time home buyer was putting down an 18% down payment. For the past three years, the median first-time home buyer was putting down, anybody want to know the number? Zero. Zero. And gosh, nobody could have guessed that default rates would have gone up when people had no skin in the game from the beginning. So, so let's just be clear about this. Now the second thing was, part of how these products began to change is they began to change the average, according to the Wall Street Journal, the average credit card contract back in 1981 was a page and a half long because it had very limited variables. And right here's the interest rate, here's the penalty fee, it happens, right? Pay it, that's the deal. The average credit card contract, according to the Wall Street Journal, by the mid early 2000s, uh, is 31 pages long. And if you've ever read the 31 pages, uh, you have discovered those additional 29 and a half pages did not get added to help the consumer. We shifted to what I call a tricks and traps pricing model so that consumers look at three things. This is what the guys who actually do the market research talk about. They look at the overt interest rate, the nominal interest rate, the one on the front of the envelope. They look at the prizes, uh, uh, frequent flyer miles, oh, you're nodding, you have them. Uh, frequent flyer miles, cash back, uh, uh, contributions to the Golden Retriever Rescue Fund. And they look at relationships. Um, that's a company that would be warm and fuzzy. This is a company that signals success. And those are the three things consumers buy credit cards on. So the new model becomes, put those credit cards in the hands of every man, woman, child in America, a few dogs, uh, and you'll make a little bit of money off every one of them in the transaction fee. Every time somebody uses that credit card, the merchant has to pay something back to the credit card issuer. So, so you'll make a little money, but what you also have is a series of lottery tickets. 
because somebody will be a little late, somebody will stumble, somebody will get a little behind, somebody will go over limit fee, somebody will, will trip up somewhere in that 29 and a half pages. And that's where the sweet spot is. That's where you make all the money. Same sort of game happened in the mortgage industry. Um, I know how we'll make more money in mortgages, said many, many people out on Wall Street. They said, we'll sell people, mortgages only make real modest percentage rates, but that's because they're just 30 year fixed instruments. They're not very fancy. I know what we'll do. We'll sell them mortgage rates that effectively will return 15% rates of interest. How can you do that? Well, you can only do that if you give them mortgages that have a lot of tricks and traps, like teaser rate mortgages. Uh, your bill will only be $400 uh, for the first 24 months. You hit the 25th month, and the interest rate skyrockets, and there's a prepayment penalty if you have to refinance into a new one. Very profitable instruments. Okay, so here's the short version of what I want to say about that. We are regulating consumer financial products absolutely the wrong way. Usury may not be the right answer anymore. We may have more sophisticated ways to do it, but the real point is we have lost our regulatory way in this area and the American consumer has paid for it. My view is we need something along the lines of a consumer product safety commission. Every can of soda, every candy, everything we touch breathe, uh, handle in America is regulated for safety at some level. Uh, you don't buy apples that are covered with carcinogens. You don't buy cosmetics that have ground glass in them. You don't buy infant car seats that collapse on impact. And yet, financial products, which believe me, are products. They are marketed like <laughs> products. They are treated like products. Financial products are not governed by that rule. They're governed by the rule of contracts. Hey, you read the 31 pages, you negotiated it fully with me, and you meant to be bound by that clause on page 17. We don't hand people a wiring diagram when they buy a toaster and say, you're supposed to figure out that right over there in circuit 24, these things were likely to burst into flames. Uh, instead, we regulate them for safety and toasters then compete to make them better for consumers. They give them better colors, they make them cheaper, they give them all the little razzmatazzes that make cute noises or do whatever they do. In financial products, we have a competitive market, but it has competed to add additional tricks and traps that make this expensive for consumers and mislead consumers about the kinds of risks they're taking. It's happened on mortgages, it's happened on credit cards, it's happened on payday loans. We now regulate, are you ready for this? Stop and think about the fact that in the financial services industry, we regulate by who the issuer is. So if, you're, have a, if you have a product that's issued by a federal bank, it'll be uh, uh, controlled by the OCC. If it's issued by a federal thrift, it will be the OTS. If it's a state bank, it will be the state charter, and they have separate. The consequence is we have created a situation of regulatory arbitrage. And that is where a company, in effect, says to its regulator, hey, um, it, you're giving me tough rules. Over at OTS, they'll give me a better deal. Uh, down in, uh, up in South Carolina, they'll give me a better deal, or South Dakota or California. So that what happens is they move around for better treatment. And since the regulatory agencies, including the OCC in Washington, derive much of their budget from those they regulate, we end up with a circumstance where the American family is simply left unprotected. So I want to make a pitch that this is an area where we need some regulatory reform to level the playing field for the American family. I'll say just two more just to say they're here as placeholders. We need to talk about foreclosure mitigation because the drop in the market is now creating its own problems that's creating further drop in the market. And then one last pitch that I want to put in here. When we're talking about the economy, Let's remember, however you want to look at them, every one of those American households, 117 American households, they are little economic units. Whatever you can do for the economic unit is something you do to improve the economy. Not all solutions start at Wall Street. Some solutions really do start at Main Street. If American families had better health care, they would be in better financial shape. If they had better child care, they would be in better financial shape. These are the areas where we're seeing enormous growth. If they had a way to send their children to college and a way to work off those loans that kids take out early on, then the American family would be in better shape. And it starts there. 
If the American family is healthier, if those 117 million units don't need to engage in deficit financing, aren't paying twice as much for health insurance in inflation-adjusted dollars than they were paying 20 years ago, if those units are back on their feet, Wall Street and the rest of the world is back on their feet. And in my view, any attempt to try to fix Wall Street, to try to fix the rest of the economy, without trying to help those American families directly <coughs> is doomed to failure. Thank you very much. Robert Lawrence. Uh, I, too, want to congratulate all of you uh, uh, upon your election. Um, and also uh, uh, join my uh, colleagues as, as members of the Dismal Science uh, in forecasting uh, uh, the rather grim prospects of our, our economy. I, I think the question uh, many people are asking is, um, are, are we actually going to relive uh, the 1930s? Now, if uh, you look uh, at the 1930s and you ask economic historians um, uh, why uh, uh, they feel policy uh, failed at that period, uh, I think you'll th hear three answers. Uh, the first is that uh, basically the banking system was allowed to fail. There were runs on banks and uh, little was done to, uh, to remedy that problem. Uh, the second was that there was a failure actually to appreciate depression economics and the role that the government had to play in its fiscal policy. That it, uh, fiscal policy at that time was not sufficiently uh, expansionary. There weren't enough uh, uh, increases in, in, in spending. And the third component uh, that I want to talk about uh, relates to uh, trade policy. In 1930, as you'll recall, uh, there were um, massive increases in tariffs in the United States, known as the Smoot-Hawley tariffs. The U.S. raised the tariff rate, average tariff rate, to about 60 percent. Uh, and, and this looked quite rational because uh, people wanted to keep the spending at home. They didn't want it to trickle out into the rest of the world. But it turned out that this set off a, a response in other parts of the world where countries also raised their tariffs. And what we got was a downward spiral in uh, global demand and global uh, trade just plummeted over the next three years. Now, historians debate as to whether the Great Depression was caused by the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, and I think there's probably a consensus that they didn't. Uh, but there is no doubt that they made matters a, a lot worse. Now, if, if we look at our uh, uh, policies today, I would uh, endorse what was said earlier. Uh, when it comes to the question of the, of the banking system, we, we've had a collapse in our, in our uh, financial system. But we've seen our policymakers um, act with a, a lot of ingenuity. Uh, trying uh, not to uh, uh, repeat the mistakes of their predecessors. I, I think uh, when it comes to fiscal policy, although hearing uh, Greg um, uh, makes me a little worried because I, I believe that fiscal policy has to play uh, a, a major role, uh, that we need um, massive increases in, in, in both um, on the tax side uh, and on the spending side, uh, not only, by the way, in uh, the United States, but all around the world, uh, we need that fiscal injection to compensate uh, for the withdrawal uh, by consumers and the increase in their, in their savings. Um, but I think on both of those fronts, we've seen action. Now, an open question is, uh, what about the trade area? Are we, in fact, going to see a repetition of the errors uh, of the 1930s, or are we there too? Uh, going to learn uh, from those mistakes. Well, uh, you might argue uh, that um, uh, this uh, fear is unwarranted uh, because we've actually improved the global trading system immensely. We've lowered uh, barriers around the world. And we haven't just uh, lowered the barriers, but we also have a, uh, a trading system, a multilateral trading system, based on the international rule of law. And so countries have legally committed uh, not to raise their tariffs beyond certain bound rates. So we are secure in that respect. 
In addition, uh, the G20 countries met uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they pledged uh, not to uh, increase uh, their, uh, trade, uh, their trade barriers. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that um, there are going to be a lot of pressures. There are going to be a lot of pressures to do things uh, that keep the demand at home. In fact, uh, if you looked at the December 8th cover of Business Week, uh, you'll see that it, it asks the question, can Obama keep those new jobs at home? In a sense, the question is, um, uh, are we going to take measures uh, to try to uh, prevent the spillovers uh, from our economy uh, into the rest of the world. It's a very rational response, just as it is for individual consumers to cut back, just as it is for banks to want to stop lending. All of those are very rational uh, behavior, but they accumulate in the economy, and they make matters worse. We live in a highly interdependent global economy in which we have structured the economy um, uh, on a global basis. And so uh, efforts to try to uh, inhibit the free flow of goods and services across international boundaries at this time could truly pre prove uh, devastating. If we needed any reminder of our interdependence, um, it's evident in the way in which the slowdown has built up all around the world. For instance, if you look at freight rates, freight rates are down by 90%. If you go and look at Long Beach, California, you can see the automobiles piling up on the dock. So what's happening is already a cumulative uh, slowdown in which uh, other countries are starting to cut back. The United States is cutting back its spending. And so we really have to be wary of, um, of making matters worse in this area. There are going to be a, a, lot, of, a lot of pressures uh, on all of you uh, to try to act um, to ensure that um, uh, the uh, uh, stimulus that you provide um, only falls uh, domestically. But I think this is a great error. It is far better to create a virtuous cycle in which countries prop each other up, rather than to repeat the experience of the 1930s in which they dragged each other down. Uh, we're debating uh, our, um, what our policy should be, not only in the financial area, where effectively uh, many of the banks have now been nationalized, uh, but also, of course, with respect to the auto companies. Um, what form should our uh, assistance be? Uh, are we going to assist them in a way that only helps uh, the domestically owned companies? Or, or are we just going to, um, uh, 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 what will we do for the other companies, many of whom are major employers uh, in the United States itself? Um, so I think we need to be mindful. I also think we need to be vigilant as to what our trading partners are doing. We need to hold their feet to the fire, just as we need to be restrained we also need to be mindful and we need to use uh, the vehicle of the World Trade Organization in monitoring what they are doing. We're seeing troubling signs in other parts of the world. China very recently uh, decided that um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, they were going to give their exporters a new set of rebates. It turns out they uh, are entitled to do this uh, under their value-added uh, tax system but nonetheless, it's a gesture which I don't think um, uh, its trading partners should simply accept. But that, I just cite that as just one example of the many uh, uh, measures in this that are likely to be taken in this area. But I also think we need to take care uh, to use the opportunity of our stimulus program uh, to undertake a number of reforms that will help our workers back at home. Uh, we have had a very tough time for the American worker. We've seen very sluggish wage growth over the last six years, basically for both blue-collar workers and college-educated workers. We've also seen immense dislocation, even prior to this uh, uh, slowdown, uh, in our manufacturing sector. Uh, we lost three million manufacturing jobs between uh, 2000 and 2003, 
Uh, and in fact, we lost an additional almost uh, 800,000 uh, over the last year. Now, in the minds of many Americans, uh, international trade is responsible for this. Uh, in my view, actually, trade is a part of the story, but it's a relatively small part. There are many other reasons uh, for these declines. Nonetheless, we do need uh, to uh, uh, help American workers directly, I think through supplementing their take-home pay with tax cuts, and also uh, with respect to uh, programs that deal with dislocation. Our unemployment uh, insurance system uh, hasn't been uh, improved uh, since basically uh, its, um, its introduction. And in particular, um, uh, we insure wages, but we don't insure benefits. So people lose their health care when they lose their jobs. Ideally, we will have universal coverage on health care. But at a minimum, we need health care insurance, uh, insurance, so that uh, people who do lose their jobs do not lose their health care insurance. I also finally think uh, we need to appreciate that um, change occurs in communities, not only in, um, at the individual level. And um, a, a really important part of the stimulus package needs to be assistance to state and local governments. But over the longer term, I believe we need mechanisms whereby state and local governments uh, can ensure their tax bases so that if they are hit by shocks like plant closings or uh, crop failures um, or um, uh, natural uh, disasters of any kind, um, uh, they can also uh, put in a claim. Um, uh, too often, uh, we, uh, have a, uh, we basically have a system in which uh, uh, local governments are required to balance their budgets. And so what we get is a downward spiral as uh, drops in their revenue uh, give rise to, to cuts in, in spending. So um, uh, this is an opportunity to put us on a much more sounder footing. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the members of the panel. Now, uh, I want to open it up for questions. We have plenty of time for comments and so forth. I'll do my best. I suspect there'll be more questions than there is time. <laughs> Just a reminder, when you do have a question, if you would be sure and push your button so that the red light comes on. And when you're done with the question, please turn it off so we don't hear you say, well, that was a dumb answer. Um, so uh, let me first, uh, uh, and I can't see everybody's name tags from here also, so uh, let me just uh, start down here. Well, let's see, gosh, be millions of questions, but I'll try to, pray. I'll, I'll just give two, how about that? Can we, um, actually my request would be to try and go with one. one? And indeed okay. we, uh, there's a sort of standard policy we have around here, which is a good question has three elements. It starts with identifying yourself, it's a short, containing only one thought, and it ends with a question mark. So uh, if we could follow those principles, that would be a big help. Yeah, Thank Jared Poles from Colorado. Um, I, this is really directed towards uh, Elizabeth. Um, it was moving from, from the macro and a lot of issues you talked about to something that's on all of our minds right now and um, uh, is relatively close to the ground. Could you tell us a little bit, drawing upon your expertise in, in bankruptcy, what it would look like um, if Detroit were to go through the default option, which would be some form of bankruptcy, Chapter 7 or 11, what, uh, you know, what would a restructuring look like if it went through that process as opposed to a government-orchestrated uh, uh, process? Well, I will try to give just a really short answer on that. And, and that is um, bankruptcy by itself is not going to cost jobs. Bankruptcy by itself is not going to shut down the business. Bankruptcy is just a process. And it's a process of an automatic stay to keep people from collecting. It's a process of, of giving a structured way to try to reshape the business and get management to come up with a plan for how they're going to devise this business on the, on the other side. Uh, the two big, the three big issues, as I hear it, um, are whether or not they can get what's called post-petition financing. Uh, uh, there's a big question about whether or not that might be government funds or some combination of government and private funds or only private funds. The big advantage to being a post-bankruptcy financer instead of the financer just before they file for bankruptcy or at some time is that post-petition financing takes priority over all old financing. So it, it, it infuses cash into the business. It creates an incentive. It's been there all along to create this incentive to infuse cash into the business. Um, the second thing that happens is um, management loses a lot of control in bankruptcy. Uh, there are real high replacement rates 
of CEOs and top management. It's not uncommon to bring in what's called turnaround management, people who come in and re-scissor businesses. Um, and the third thing that I understand is an issue in the auto industry is it is an automatic default on everything. And while the company is protected when there's an automatic default on everything, that's what the automatic stay does. No creditor can come in and seize anything. Uh, there's a question in this world we have created of collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps and so on. There will be winners and losers who have made various bets on what's going to happen to GM's bonds, to GM's other obligations. So that's just kind of the key part. Ultimately, the real question is, is there a plan to build cars that people want to buy? And if so, can these companies get there? If they can, there will be jobs. And if they can, they will become profitable at some point. If not, there won't be jobs. And bankruptcy, bankruptcy is just a tool. If you don't have a plan, bankruptcy isn't going to give you a plan. And if you do have a plan, bankruptcy can often be useful in getting you there. Okay, right over here. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I can't see. The names no are unaligned. My apologies. My name is Laura Richardson, and I'm from California. And in particular, I represent both the Port of Long Beach and Los Angeles, which covers 45% of our nation's cargo. So my question is to you, Mr. Lawrence. Um, you talked a little bit about our responsibility as trading partners and our trading partners' responsibility. Um, I'm working on legislation right now, and one of our concerns from trading is that clearly our trading partners are utilizing Canada through Prince Rupert to now uh, avoid coming in through our ports. And also you have Mexico, which is in Colonnette, that's now looking at doing <coughs> a mega port. So clearly there are what some people would view are attacks on our economy. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on what we could do to be supportive, but yet still we have to protect our base as well. Well, um, my view is that um, we need to facilitate international trade because um, we benefit. We benefit from being able to sell abroad and from being able to buy from the rest of the world and a key dimension is 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 the costs of getting the goods here and getting the goods out and in order to do that um, our economy is going to benefit from the most competitive infrastructure systems that we have and so to be honest with you um, I, I think we want to see a, a lot of competition in uh, these infrastructure systems uh, whether they are located on our border and run by our trading partners or whether we run them ourselves. I think in the long run we're going to be benefited by that. Now we need to be mindful though that we don't hinder our ports. Uh, and in particular, uh, we have um, uh, to, to make those uh, borders operate smoothly, um, a lot of regulatory reforms have to, have to take place. Um, uh, but, but I think in the, in the long run, it's, it's going to have to be an open competition and that your port is competing uh, with these other ports for, for entry into the United States. And in the long run, you have to ask what's going to make yourself, what, what, what is going to make you more competitive. So, I don't think that really answered the question. So my question is, are you in support of us, for example, allowing trucks from Mexico that don't have the same regulations in terms of safety? Um, I recently went to the port of Barcelona where only five containers are being inspected, um, which is clearly not in accordance with the 9-11 recommendations. So it's one thing to say we want to have open borders, but if we're not receiving the protections that we require, um, then there's a problem. And there's usually a cost associated with it. No, I do not think we should give up on our safety regulations or on our health regulations or on our national security regulations. So um, we need to insist that those are adhered to. But once, uh, but once those are done, I think we should have an open competition. So I'm not in favor of weakening uh, the regulatory structures that keep, <coughs> keep our products safe and, and, and indeed our country safe. Mike Hoffman, Colorado. I think my question is that is it, it seems like the, the, my question is the more we, is it the more we engage 
in trying to reduce the pain uh, in the recession that we're in uh, through uh, stimulative spending or, or, or other policies, uh, is it going to handicap uh, this economy in the future? I mean, versus going through the pain now. I don't. I don't see any virtue in the pain. So I'm, I'm not. There are. There's. There are some points of view that that recessions have cleansing effects and they, they leave the economy stronger in the end. I don't. I don't see any evidence for that. And I think that's among professional economists. That's a minority view. I, um, I think most economists would say, do do what you can to avoid uh, the recession. The question is, what is it? Uh, and to what extent is it? Is it fixing the financial system? To what extent is it monetary policy? To what extent is it fiscal policy? Uh, well, actually, one of the scholars. One of the great scholars of the Great Depression is Ben Bernanke, as you probably know. Another great scholar of the Great Depression is Christy Romer, who's taking over to be chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the new Obama uh, administration. A lot of her work is on the Great Depression, is looks at what got us into it and what got us out of it. Her answer is that what got us into it was bad monetary policy, and what got us out of it was better monetary policy. So I think her work suggests that monetary policy has to have a large role. That doesn't mean that there's no role for fiscal policy, but a very large share, I believe, of the answer is going to have to come for out of the Federal Reserve System. On, on fiscal policy, there is this, this sort of paradox that uh, uh, what we need, I think there's a pretty broad uh, consensus, as uh, Greg says, that what we need is a fiscal stimulus, uh, both in the form, I would say, of, uh, of, of tax cuts and, and spending increases in the very short term. But on the other hand, we already had a very severe uh, Fin fiscal outlook for the longer term, and it's going to get worse over the next 10 or 20 years with the retirement of the baby boom generation, which is already starting, and Social Security, and especially Medicare, et cetera. And so it's a hard message to get across, but we need to combine stimulus today with measures, and I don't think we need, we should wait three years before putting in those other measures. I think it should be part of what the plan is today to try to move us back onto uh, a more uh, sustainable and responsible path for the longer term. So on the tax side, uh, the, the President-elect Obama campaigned on tax cuts for the lower 95 percent and on uh, uh, raising tax rates uh, uh, or allowing to expire it's not the uh, tax breaks that, that uh, benefited so much the upper 5 percent. Well, I would say give the tax break, and I think this is where they're heading, give the tax break to the lower 95 percent of American workers now and, and hold off a couple years on the raising taxes back to where, where they, th they were 10 years ago, on the uh, upper 5 percent. And similarly with fiscal policy, uh, with spending policy, uh, design from the beginning uh, a plan that gives you stimulus in the short term. And, and to be frank, this, is, this, this was done wrong 10 years ago. Uh, it was a stimulus that helped get us out of the 2001 recession. It's partly why the recession was so moderate, but it put us on a disastrous longer term fiscal path, in my view. Can I, uh, can I, can I have one sentence? Sure. Oh, on the, on the question of how to solve a long-term fiscal problem, when you poll professional economists, and they've actually done this, the solution that economists like the best is raising the retirement age. For Social Security. For Social Security, and maybe presumably it apply for Medicare as well, but perhaps. But so there's, there's, a, I think there's, a, there's a widespread consensus that's the right thing to do among professional economists. One thing there's, 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 one, there's one difference between us and you guys. We have tenure. You guys have to get reelected every two years. <laughs> so that's what I was about to say. Economists don't run for office, uh, yeah. and if they did, they don't go very far. Uh, the, uh, let me turn to, to Elizabeth. I did want to make one mention for any members uh, watching on the audience or whatever that don't. We use this term fiscal versus monetary policy a lot. Understand that fiscal means the things that the, the federal government does in terms of its spending and tax policy. Monetary tends to be the things that are done by the Federal Reserve Bank in terms of affecting how much money supply there is, setting of interest rates and the like. Um, and so mostly the Congress can affect fiscal policy. What the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke does and so forth is monetary policy, though of course one helps oversee the other and so there are interactions. Elizabeth, you want to comment also? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say too that economists might like that because they have jobs that have no heavy lifting in it. Uh, so. Um, uh, not everybody wants to hit 67 trying to do that kind of work. But, but I'm just going to make a, a, a very brief point. And, and that is just another way to understand about some of these, these spending questions. Just another, I'm just going to take a little kind of microcosm about what's going on. And that is to look at the question of, of what to do about these asset best uh, securities based on mortgages, right? We've got this real problem. And the real problem is that the stream of revenues that's produced from all these American families um, uh, had been valued up here. That's where the stock market had valued, had been put in everybody's portfolio, had been sold and sliced and diced and so on. 
And the problem we've got right now is that the stream of revenues simply won't support that kind of valuation. And so at some point, those two things have to be brought into alignment. Now, we can put a bunch of money in, and we're talking about this, putting a bunch of money in to try to prop up this market, to try to buy these securities and kind of create a, a floor under them. But if the reality is that the families who are, who are pumping that money out month after month after month can only support the valuation off that is really down here, then those two things have to be brought into alignment. And that's just pain, and that just happens. There are going to be some people who are going to lose when that happens. There are going to be some investors who are going to lose when that happens. But spending money to prop up markets, at least in my view, is a loser's game, and it's worse than just kind of zero-sum loser's game. It's a loser's game that then saddles these people with tax obligations into the future so they have even less capacity to produce going forward. So, so I'm just going to make a narrower point than, than the economists about you really got to be careful about watching what the money is being spent for and, and what the intent is. I keep wanting to hear what the, what the line is, how, how it was supposed to go from A to B to C to fix a problem. And I'm, I'm, real, I'm real nervous about some ways that that goes. I'm Ann Kirkpatrick from Arizona, and Dean Elwood, I was really interested in your presentation yesterday about the changing demo demographics. And sort of following up on Elizabeth's answer, are there any models um, that really show what a healthy U.S. economy will look like in 25 years based on those changing demographics? In other words, it seems to me we should have a strategy to build a strong economy looking forward uh, 25 years, and that's where we should be putting our efforts. And if there are models, how do we how do we get our hands on those? It's a great. Question. It's, it, is a, it is a great question. I mean, it's, in some sense, economists favor decentralized decision making as opposed to a model what the economy looks like 25 years that looks like sort of top down central planning. So I thought we don't have a model quite in that s sense. I think the big question about the economy 25 years from now is how are we going to, you guys, going to close the gap between benefits that have been projected from my, our generation when I'm retired and the, and the tax revenues that you're going to get to collect from my children. And the big question, I know the way I, the way I say it to uh, my, my, my Harvard freshman who I teach, I say, look, my generation of baby boomers have promised ourselves a certain level of Social Security and Medicare benefits, and we've promised that you're going to pay for it. <laughs> And so the question is, how, how is that going to really going to work out? Are you really going to give me those benefits and impose much higher tax rates on my children, or are you going to cut back on my benefits? That's a political question, as much as an economic question, but it's really the question you'll be facing in the next decade. I would add just one little tiny other piece to it about the modeling question that, that alarms me. A, the answer is no. It's obvious nobody's got a model for this. And, and not really thinking a whole lot about it. But I'm going to add a, a, another piece that has me worried, because I think nobody thinks about it. With every succeeding year, not every succeeding generation, but every succeeding year, we load up young people with more debt, student loan <coughs> debt and credit card debt, basically, to start their lives. So I started my life with $1,800 in NDEA loans and paid those off by teaching public school for, for a couple of years. Our children are starting the game of life at 22, not, not dead flat broke, but dead flat broke is still 50 miles in front of them. They're starting so far behind because of what we're doing with debt to young people. And if we want to talk about models, about modeling this out, I, I am deeply frightened about what it means to keep trying to run an economy where every succeeding group of young people coming into it to work are starting out with these kinds of debt burdens as they make then their decisions about what jobs to take, whether or not to go for further education, uh, whether or not to get married and buy homes and have families. Uh, that's, that's part, of, at least, of the modeling we're missing. Down here. Hi, Chris Lee from New York. My issue is more so on, I heard free trade sounded like it was, uh, everyone in this room was an advocate of that, as am I, but concerned about fair trade. And you look at China and the fact that they have a currency that is undervalued in the market, pegged to the dollar. What, what areas can we go with? Obviously, I'm not a huge fan of tariffs, 
but we've got to bring them to the table to allow our manufacturing to compete. What do we do or what options do we have to try to push the Chinese along to float that currency? Well, I, I, um, I, I see the uh, Chinese exchange rate as, as, as only a symptom of a deeper issue that is a challenge that we're now facing. Uh, basically, uh, the United States has been overspending, as we've heard, and we've been stimulating the world economy, and we've been borrowing from the Chinese in order to do that because the Chinese have been saving huge amounts of their incomes. Uh, they've had rapid growth, but in China, people are deeply insecure. If you uh, lose your job, you have no benefits, you're only allowed to have one child, so no one's going to look after you when you uh, retire. And so what we've seen is a massive increase in, in the savings rate in China. And what we do need is, a, is, a, is, as we look out over the medium term, is a restructuring in which we save more and they spend more, in which they generate more of their growth in terms of domestic demand and less of their growth through an undervalued currency and, and, and exporting. But if we simply tell them to change their exchange rate without changing their fundamental spending uh, uh, behavior, I, I think we could see deep problems in, 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 in China. So, so I think we need to work. I, I do think we need to um, call them. By the way, I, I am not so convinced that a uh, weaker, uh, at least a stronger Chinese currency is the answer to our problems. I think most of the goods we buy from China um, if the Chinese currency appreciates, we're going to buy from other developing countries because many of those goods are no longer made in the United States. And we don't compete heavily with China in export markets. The, the kind of goods we export aren't the kind of goods that China exports. So I, I think other developing countries should be more concerned about the Chinese exchange rate than we do. So I think it needs to be part of a discussion with China but there has to be a fundamental change uh, in their uh, underlying policies so that they don't have these huge um, unsustainable surpluses which are the counterparts to our huge deficits. So uh, I agree that the Chinese renminbi should, uh, should appreciate, but mainly in their own interests, as, as, as Robert says. And by the way, it has appreciated somewhat already. I think uh, Congress has made a huge mistake in placing so much emphasis on the exchange rate with China. There are so many other issues that uh, are more important uh, that we should be negotiating with China. And to begin with, we don't have much leverage. I mean, people better get used to this. We are the world's largest net debtor. They are the creditor. We owe them. We don't have that much leverage. The leverage we have, we should save for things we really need, like help with North Korea and all kinds of uh, you know, proliferation issues, et cetera, et cetera. In economics, what we most need them to do uh, to push them along doing more than the currency is to uh, expand demand, to uh, do the structural shift away from manufacturing, which they're really good at and export a lot, and it's time for them to move into services and uh, health care and provide a safety net for their own people. That would help their people and that would help the international situation as well. Robert's quite right. If the currency appreciated the things we're now buying from them, we'd buy from, from uh, Southeast Asia instead. Okay. Um Right up here. Steve Driehaus from Ohio. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently uh, over the last several months in Washington about the regulatory envi environment and financial services sector. Several of you talked this morning about laxed regulations around you know, risk, around you know, consumer protections. I'm interested in knowing from the panel if, in fact, you believe we need to strengthen regulations in financial services and specifically what you would target. Well, I'm easy. Um, I would, I, the answer for me is just absolutely yes. And the way I would start is I would start by acknowledging that Congress can't do it one regulation at a time. Uh, you're, you're very poorly suited to do that um, uh, because money is the most innovative place to be. Uh, if you tell me uh, we can't have uh, uh, 15 day default clauses will move to universal default clauses. We'll, you know, we, I just have to change words on a piece of paper and these, these instruments change. And it's hard for you to find out about them. You don't find about, out about them until much, much later. And quite frankly, this is a really lopsided lobbying area. Uh, uh, there are 
many billions of dollars to be made on the side of uh, regulatory laxness in this area, at least in the short run, even though not in the long run. And uh, nobody really, there's no organized group on the other side that matches that. So from my perspective, what this means is we really need to acknowledge that consumer financial products are products. Nobody can read 31 pages. You got to get rid of the tricks and traps pricing. And for me, it means we do the same thing we did back in the 1970s when we established the Consumer Product Safety Commission, that nobody read toaster wiring diagrams or analyzed the paint. Uh, and we had something that then could, could change over time. And I want to be clear here. When we talk about regulations, it's regulations so that we can have markets work better so that people can understand what it is that they're buying and they can assess the risk appropriately. We want to talk about personal responsibility. Quite frankly, I don't know how anybody has personal responsibility on uh, 248 pages of mortgage loan documentation for which your own lawyer will say, uh, don't read it, just sign there, sign there, sign there, and sign there. So this is really about making those things work in the same way that toasters work and car seats work. And so I think it's an area that is ripe for it. Frankly, I think it would have happened in the 70s, except we still had usury laws. And so long as we had usury laws, we didn't need this form of regulation. There was, there was no advantage. There was no tricks and traps capacity because there just weren't enough percentage points in there. So I think a nimble agency is the right way to go in consumer products. I have other, but, but let me give more space to others. Greg, do you want to comment or do you disagree or not? I, I'm not an expert on consumer regulation, so I'm not sure I um, have any d disagreement or even comment on, on, on what Elizabeth just said. I'm not sure that the, those issues would have particularly saved us from the, the, the housing bubble and the current crisis we're facing. Um, and I think the, so the, and the, and the issue of regulatory reform is, I think, a longer-term issue that's going to have to happen slower, whereas issues like fiscal stimulus um, is issues that you're going to be facing on day one, if, if you're not facing already. So I think th th sort of st some in terms of staging, I think you need to think about the, regu the re regulatory structure in a, on a longer term basis, but then you, think, but you need to think about the macro picture um, absolutely immediately. C could I just say one thing, though, in response to that? The idea that we have a long time to think about consumer financial product regulation is simply wrong. You were citing uh, the uh, uh, December 8th cover of Newsweek. Take a look at the December uh, 15th, I think it is, cover of Newsweek. The subprime predators are back. Uh, they haven't gone away. This, the problems I'm describing have not disappeared. Uh, One-way credit card companies have decided they're going to weather this storm is they're just raising everybody's interest rates, including the interest rates on good customers who've paid on time. Uh, mortgage lenders are figuring out that in their old capacity, uh, they were selling one kind of product. Now they're selling them to FHA. They're trying to, they're, they're moving around. Uh, we can't fix this problem from the top down alone. Uh, if you keep chewing at families at the bottom, uh, bloodletting at the bottom, we can't rebuild this economy. So frankly, I'm, I'm as alarmed and, and, and want to push as quickly for some basic protections in this area, just, just some minimum. And the notion, I, I really want to say strongly, yes, we could have averted a large part of this crisis. If we had had a basic safety regulation on mortgages, I'll tell you one factor. If you couldn't have done prepayment penalties, so that every time you priced a mortgage, it needed to be for the company that was pricing it, revenue positive from the first day, not because the law said it had to be, but because economics would say it had to be. Because you took out that prepayment penalty that gets hidden, that nobody understands how you, that lets you do tricky pricing. If that had happened, we never would have inflated the housing market in the way that we did. And Wall Street would never have poured the billions of dollars that they did in because it would never have been such a profitable product and supported it. So I think it is directly related to our crisis. We're, gonna, we're running out of time. Sorry. We're going to take a few more questions. Uh, let me uh, uh, be an inappropriate moderator and add one little thought here, uh, wearing my role as a, a dean's hat, which is we do have a history of setting up regulations at times of crisis. That is not a pleasant history. And I think the strategy of thinking about this is, we, and the other important lessons about markets is when you squeeze one place, it squeezes back someplace else. What I like about Elizabeth's idea is saying, no, let's not write a bunch of regulations that just say, okay, no pre, oh, I get it. The message is no prepayment. That will solve it. I think, I think regulation by 
overlapping congressional committee is not a great strategy. So the question is how do you come craft something that does in a fairly rapid uh, space really think effectively about how to manage a system that by the way is, is managed by people as you, th there is so much money slashing around that a, a comma in a different place changes everything. And believe me, your lobbyists know that. So yeah, Mark. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'm Mark Schauer from Michigan. Uh, great panel. Elizabeth, thanks for trying to put a human face on this. Uh, in Michigan, um, economists are projecting the unemployment rate to exceed 10 percent next year. I mean, people are really hurting. I do want to push um, uh, Robert Lawrence a little bit on the trade issue. Um, uh, obviously, it was a big issue in a lot of campaigns in industrial states. Um, I learned about negative externalities when I was in undergraduate school from people like you, and whether it's uh, the environment, whether it's uh, worker safety, um, uh, whether you know we're also concerned about intellectual property, uh, we've lost entire sectors of our economy. What specific things can you recommend that wouldn't hurt overall trade in the global economy that can be inserted in trade agreements to protect some of those and, and create a fair balance uh, of trade? Well, you, you mentioned um, intellectual property, and in fact, um, those rules are in the trading agreements. Now, um, uh, so, so TRIPS is part of the um, WTO rules. Uh, and stronger intellectual property is in every one of the bilateral agreements that we have negotiated. Uh, we have now, um, uh, we, we have environmental uh, and in fact labor standards that have been introduced into trade agreements now. Uh, the Peru agreement, which actually got a lot of support um, from both Democrats and Republicans, has much stronger measures uh, on that score. They're included, actually, currently in the Korea Agreement and the Colombia Agreement. Um, so, so I think we've made a lot of headway. Um, there remains an open question about the NAFTA, where the um, uh, side agreements were much weaker. Uh, and uh, President-elect uh, Obama has said that he wants to, to reopen that. Um, I, I think it's, it's gonna be, it would be dangerous to reopen the whole agreement, but I think those side agreements certainly could be negotiated. I don't think these are things we can decide unilaterally. Um, I think we have to um, uh, make the kind of um, uh, efforts to, to uh, get our uh, trading partners to go along. And I think we've actually made significant progress, although we needed to continue to do more. Okay, as we're running out of time, what I'm going to do is take three questions uh, without answers and then just go down the panel to answer them. So if we could, I'll do my best to try and uh, just pick three randomly. Go ahead, you, you madam. Can't see the name. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's all right. Suzanne Cosmas from Florida. I appreciate uh, you all being here today, and uh, particularly Elizabeth, as was said before, your focus on uh, the sort of individual and personal responsibility and the family as an economic unit. I think that's a, an important uh, point to be made. I want to go back to the beginning, though, and Jeff's uh, slide and the and the five top uh, boxes that look almost like the perfect storm for the economic crisis that we find ourselves in right now and try to <clears throat> assess slightly the, the um, not who's at fault because I don't know that that get, gets us anywhere moving forward, but in terms of monetary policy and what you call underestimating the risk in financial markets, I wonder if you could more correctly say not only underestimated but under-regulated with uh, recognizing what you said about our regulating in times of crisis. We are dealing now with, with an unprecedented situation where uh, uh, private market free enterprise businesses are coming to the taxpayer and asking to be bailed out to the tune of 700 billion at any <coughs> one given time, which could be more as we all know. Uh, what? At what point do you say to yourself, this isn't simply a decision going forward about whether we adjust monetary policy or fiscal policy or even the, the regulations with regard to credit cards and mortgages, but how do we hold these uh, free market companies accountable for the situation in which they find themselves, uh, that is to say the whole 
house of cards of our American economy about to fall and the taxpayers having, uh, being charged with uh, holding it up. If you could address that. I'm going to take two more questions and then we'll go to down here. Yes. <coughs> Pedro Pierluisi from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Quickly, on the spending side, what's going to come quickly before us is the stimulus package. Any specific comments about the components of it as outlined so far by President-elect Obama and his team? And last, right down here. Steve Scalise from New Orleans. Uh, one of the, the things that was brought up during the last financial bailout was the role that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac played in attempts by Congress in the past that had failed to try to regulate them. and changes to the Community Reinvestment Act in the late 1990s that may have uh, encouraged them to give loans to people regardless of ability to pay. Uh, going forward, what changes and, and reforms would you suggest making to Fannie and Freddie uh, to, to change their role in this whole uh, housing market uh, mortgage bubble? So three short answers. What do we do about regulation? What do we do about the <laughs> stimulus package? And what do we do about Freddie and Fannie? Less than one. Um, so, yeah, those are hard and deep questions. Um, let me actually combine the regulation and the Fannie question. Uh, I think this, the story of, of um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is a very sad one in the sense that there were a lot of economists who had talked for a long time, and both, the, both Republican economists and going back to the Clinton administration, like people like Larry Summers, who had, who had warned about the pro prospects uh, the housing market with, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I don't think it's the whole story of what's going on now, but that's part of the story, and it's not a happy story. And it's, a, it's not a happy story in part because the, the process became so politicized. Uh, and, one, and thinking about regulation going forward, you, you're going to have to start, start thinking, you're going to think hard about the regulatory structure. There'll be a lot of discussion about that over the next few years for sure. But the fear is that it's going to again become politicized and go down the same route that Fannie did, where every, all the economists who kn kn knew there was a problem waiting to happen, and it happened, but the, the political process uh, failed us for reasons that I think are pretty clear um, at this point. Uh, on, this, on this spending uh, side, uh, you know, I think infrastructure spending makes sense to the extent that the particular projects pass a cost-benefit test. You know, Keynesian economics from the 1930s, Keynes used to say, well, if, if you just hire people to dig holes and fill them up again, that's, that's stimulating the economy, that's a good thing. Well, I don't personally think that's a good way use, use of money. I think uh, infrastructure spending makes sense if each of the projects makes sense uh, from the standpoint of having benefits that exceed the costs. Uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd much rather prefer to see tax cuts, things like um, you know, bonus depreciation, which, which we saw uh, uh, in, the, in the last recession, which I think did help. Some research out of the University of Michigan suggests that. Things like perhaps a payroll tax uh, uh, cut for, for a year or two. Uh, in order to encourage job creation. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of ideas that are floating around. That's the issues that you guys will be debating in the next months. Jeff, very quickly. So I guess the common theme on these three questions is the point that in a crisis, it's an opportunity, uh, a terrible thing to waste, it's been said. But as Ardina said, they usually, they often are wasted. And often, the, the, uh, yes, the answer is more regulation. But often, it's a knee-jerk reaction that makes things worse rather than better. It's got to be the right kind of regulation. So to run through the three uh, uh, quickly, Suzanne Cosmos is on uh, Florida. Yes, I think that uh, regulation to uh, reduce the amount of leverage uh, and, and increase uh, capital requirements. Uh, uh, for example, the, the originate to distribute model on mortgages uh, that uh, the mortgage broker uh, sells the mor uh, mortgage, lends the money, and then sends it to some, sells it to someone else and doesn't keep any of it at all, um, or a capitalization, uh, capital requirements uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, credit default swaps, et cetera. There's, but, but the devil's in the details. It's t tough stuff. On um, where, where the money should be spent, uh, there's a, a usual critique is uh, something like infrastructure. By the time you get around to it, it's too late, number one. And number two is a lot of, you know, look at the big dig here. I mean, often it's not very efficiently done, shall we say. Um, but uh, there, it can be done. It can be done. And I, I would return money to the states, give money to the states who have infrastructure investment projects that are already underway that they're having to stop. Uh, so that would get going right away. And yes, make sure that it's uh, 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 that's something we need for the longer term. I agree with the Greg, uh, uh, it, it, to not spending money just to spend money. But currently, there are cities and states closing schools, shutting down subway lines, shutting down bus lines, shutting down uh, good investment projects, and, and, and we should get the money to them quickly so it could be spent again. Also, environmental uh, 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 investment. Lastly, on Fannie and Freddie. And I'm with Greg. Many economists' first choice would to say, BBB to say, government really shouldn't be in the business of trying to 
shift the American public away from renting towards homeowning uh, to the everybody. But, but the problem is nobody except economists believes that. Everyone else thinks the more homeowners, the better. So I would say accept it, that that's going to be a political goal. Keep Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the government because the problem is you pretend that it's not there for a public interest and it's a private shareholder, and yet the government is there backing it. That's how we got into trouble. If you're going to do it, keep it in the government. So next thing I turn to Elizabeth, I want to warn you, Elizabeth is – has to literally run out of the door in about one second for an airplane. I know many of you would like to talk with her. She's going to be wandering the halls of Congress because you hired her. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm sorry that she's going to have to run quickly. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to, I am going to try to be quick, though. I, how do you hold companies uh, accountable? My answer at the beginning is if they want our money, then they have to make themselves accountable. They have to tell us how they're going to be made accountable. We cannot be the softest chump. Uh, out there who will lend money uh, just because it comes from the government. Uh, we should be the toughest guys, not the easiest. On the stimulus package, I just want you to remember something. There's a little thing in Parade Magazine. That's the kind of stuff I like to read. Uh, they did a little survey. How are you going to spend your stimulus check? 60% of those responding said, I'm going to use it to pay off credit card bills. Uh, that doesn't produce jobs. That didn't move it back in the ways we talk about. So think about that if it's just cash as opposed to jobs or other things that need to be done. Fannie and Freddie, you're right, what a sad story. Fannie and Freddie were often a force for good. And I want to make this little point because it, it may have slipped away. Community Reinvestment Act, subprime was invented long before we got here, but subprime used to mean in the 1990s that you paid about 80 basis points more for your 30-year fixed mortgage than prime. You, you paid a little premium above prime to cover the risk. And that's what it was about. And that was very useful. That helped expand home ownership with very low default rates. The trick in Fannie and Freddie uh, was they, for a long time, because they controlled the money, kept some kind of regulation in the mortgage market, not overtly, but through their kind of market devices. And then what happened is people found out how to do an end run around Franny, Fannie and Freddie and go straight to the markets. The minute that happened, Fannie and Freddie had to make a decision. Either they could be the clean lenders forever and they were going to shrink market share because of all that was going on on Wall Street, or they were going to compete. And that is that they were going to offer and take products that got increasingly dirty. And Fannie and Freddie chose the second path. Now, they made a lot of money in the meantime, but it brought them to where they are. And that suggests, I have to say, I agree with Jeffrey here, that that suggests you've got to keep it in-house in the government, that this mixed notion of how we were going to get upsides from the marketplace, it tells us it, frankly, just didn't work. So I'll stop there. Thomas? Yes, if, um, to come back to the issue of, of uh, regulatory uh, reform, I think the general, what we've been hit by is not simply the fact that we have poorly regulated our banks, but the shadow banks, the uh, substitute banks that have emerged uh, uh, have become extremely uh, potent sources of risk. And I think the general principle has to be that if you are too big to fail, if you as a financial institution are, uh, have the capacity to impose social costs, you have to be regulated. So um, it seems to me we have to expand the scope of, of who we regulate because um, it's too late after the fact when they come calling for help. In terms of stimulus package, we have to think about where is the, um, uh, wh wh where is the money most likely to be spent. Uh, and it does seem to me that state and local governments, given the fact that they, are, uh, they balance their budgets, so when they get more money, they spend it. So they are a logical target. The third, the third group, of course, are people who are unemployed because they have, hopefully, transitory reductions in their income. If you give them more money, they are going to spend it. So my prime candidates would be the state and local governments and use the opportunity to reform the unemployment insurance. And I concur that the integration of private profit motive with a social role for Fannie and Freddie was a disaster. We have to separate those two, uh, those two aspects. All right. My thanks to the panel. Thanks to all of you for being here. Great question. Could I ask the members to reconvene in that room, just the room, no, the no, Allison no, Dining no, Room, no, where no, we've no, been no, previously no, immediately no, no, after no, this no, meeting? No, you no, could no, just no, join no, me in there no, right no, now. On International Finance and Macroeconomics at the National Bureau of Economic Research, 
He is also a member of the Business Cycle Dating Committee. Uh, you may have heard a couple of days ago they declared we've been in recession for about a year at the same time that he claims it's not causal. All stock markets around the world fell by 7%, so he's responsible for decline in the total wealth of the world by 7%. Uh, the, uh, from 1996 to 1999, uh, he was a member of President Clinton's Council on Economic Advisors, and his responsibilities there uh, involved international economics, macro, and the environment. Uh, he has been, uh, had a PATS appointment to the Federal Reserve at the, at the uh, International Monetary Fund and many other such places. Uh, let me uh, next turn to Greg Mankiw uh, further on his right. He's a professor of economics. Uh, he, he's a professor in the economics department here at Harvard. Um, he literally wrote the book. Uh, many, maybe most undergraduates nowadays who when they go in and take an introductory course in economics will use <coughs> principles of economics. And that's a book that uh, Greg has written. This is, of course, it's sold over a million copies. It's been translated into 20 different languages. He's also written one of the, the premier intermediate uh, textbooks on macroeconomics. I was asking him how much it's being revised right at this moment. Uh, it is a remarkable time. He's a prolific writer himself. He has research uh, is on everything from price adjustment and consumer behavior, financial markets. And he served from 2003 to 2005 as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Um, he too has been uh, affiliated with many institutions ranging from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to the Congressional Budget Office. Elizabeth Warren on my left is the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She teaches a contract law, bankruptcy, and commercial law, of course, an issue that suddenly is one of the most popular courses in all of Harvard, though she's always been one of the greatest teachers. Uh, she's certainly written frequently and testifies uh, often on issues ranging from credit laws to personal bankruptcy. She's one of her main contributions and the uh, focus of much of her work has been what's been happening to the middle class. And indeed, uh, uh, she's uh, written numerous books, but for example, one is The Two Income Trap, Why Middle Class Mothers and Fathers Are Going Broke. Uh, she's a member of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's um, Committee on uh, Economic Inclusion. But most importantly, uh, she, on November 14th of this year, was cast to the Federal Reserve or the IMF or the private forecasters. Pretty much everybody expects uh, the, the recession to continue at least until the middle of 2009, which would mean that it will be uh, the longest post-war recession. So by that measure, uh, uh, worst, uh, worst recession. Nowhere near the Great Depression. That, that's, uh, let me just uh, put that one aside. Okay, how did we get here? Well, this is my attempt uh, to uh, put uh, a, a, just about everything, I had to leave some things out, into one slide. And, and this is my, my last slide, uh, so you'll be relieved uh, to hear. So at the top, I have uh, five uh, relatively fundamental causes uh, or origins, and I welcome uh, amendments or corrections from my fellow panelists. Uh, one problem is, at least in retrospect, monetary policy was too easy. Uh, roughly between 2003 and 2005. There was this period when interest rates were uh, rock bottom. And it's, this is much easier to say in retrospect. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily give Alan Greenspan, uh, who was chairman of the Fed at the time, too hard a time on, uh, on this, given what was known at the time. And there's areas other than monetary policy where I think he made, made, uh, made worse mistakes. But in, in retrospect, it was too easy. And it gave rise. Money went out of uh, treasury bills and because they didn't pay much interest and they went into everything else, housing, stocks, commodities, emerging markets, and so on. Um, second, the financial markets way underestimated risk in the years 2004, 2005, 2006. And I have in mind precise uh, precise things that go into formulas when the people in the financial markets, the hot shot traders, trade uh, options and, uh, and uh, junk bonds and all the rest, they have, they have models that tell them what the degree of risk is. And for technical reasons that I won't go into, well, basically because they were just looking backwards and things had been calm in the past. And so they way underestimated risk when I think uh, one could have reasonably said there's a number of very great uncertainties in the horizon, on the horizon, which have to do with some of these other factors. Number three is failures of corporate governance, and it's here where maybe some reforms uh, over time would be appropriate. Uh, one would be executive compensation and the heavy use of uh, options to uh, 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 compensate uh, top executives, which may give them an incentive to uh, 
to uh, take take more risk than we want. We like risk taking, but too much, uh, and it's particularly with regard to short term profits and disregarding uh, longer term uh, uh, health. The fourth recently given an opportunity to question some leading economists about the issues they'll be facing next year on Capitol Hill. They gathered at a conference hosted by Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is an hour 40 minutes. I'm Bill Purcell, the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. As uh, the people in this room know, the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Kennedy School have been hosting this program for newly elected members of Congress since 1972. More than 600 members of Congress uh, have been participants in this program, and today we have present in this room uh, 40 women and men, uh, Democrats and Republicans, newly elected to Congress from all across this country. Uh, it offers congressmen and congresswomen their first opportunity to spend time with their colleagues from both political parties and to talk and think about the issues that are directly in front of them and America. Uh, this morning's discussion is entitled Understanding the Economic Crisis. Leading our panel of Harvard experts is the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, David Elwood, recognized as one of this nation's leading scholars on poverty and welfare. Dean Elwood's work has been credited with significantly influencing public policy in the United States and abroad. He's a labor economist. His most recent uh, research focuses on the changing structure of American families. It's my privilege to welcome Dean David Elwood. Thank you. We are here this morning to talk about the obvious and most interesting and important set of issues that will confront all of you. Uh, in the first months and I'm afraid the first years of your terms in Congress. We're very fortunate today to have a very, very distinguished panel. We have uh, three former members of the Council of Economic Advisors and, and the person that is currently leading the congressional oversight of the uh, panel, that, the, the congressional oversight panel of what's going on in terms of the emergency reaction. So let me briefly introduce each of the folks. Um, then they will each talk uh, for about 10 minutes and then we hopefully will have a very free-flowing and open discussion. But uh, it's, it is obviously a time of enormous turmoil and uncertainty, and so we're going to do our best to provide uh, some straightforward analysis of it. The first speaker today is the person directly on my right, uh, Jim, Jan, uh, Jeff Frankel. He is the James Harpell Professor of Capital Formation here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he directs the program I selected to chair the Congressional Oversight Panel on the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was, said, was quoted as saying, the panel will provide independent and ongoing oversight to ensure that the economic recovery program is managed with full transparency and strict accountability. So it's very useful to have Elizabeth here with us today. So she's often, she's perennially recognized as one of the 50 most influential women attorneys and the like. Finally, Robert Lawrence on my far left is the Albert L. Williams Professor of International Trade and Investment here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, he's also involved in a number of other places like the National Economic, Bureau of Economic Research and the like. He was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors between 1998 and 2000 under President Clinton. His research is focused on trade policy. Uh, he currently serves as the faculty chair of the Practice of Trade Co Policy Executive Program at Harvard Kennedy School, which often brings trade ministers from around the world to talk and look and explore. Uh, he's been on advisory boards at the Congressional Budget Office, Overseas Development Council, and so on. He, too, is the author of many books and articles such as Crimes and Punishments, Retaliation Under uh, WTO, Regionalism and Multilateralism, and the like. So each of these folks has uh, much to offer. And what I'm going to first ask is uh, 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 Professor Frankel and Professor Mankiw to give us a little bit of a sense of how we got where we're at uh, and begin to touch on where we're headed and what we're trying to do. And then I'll turn it over to, to uh, uh, Professor Warren and, and Professor Lawrence to, to give us some additional insights uh, on where we're, where we're heading and what's been going on. So let me start with Jeff Frankel. Now, uh, I am, you may watch me passing notes. I'm going to be a strict timekeeper here. Uh, Jeff is, uh, pro has some slides here, and um, he's known for his slides. I will say no more. Uh, Jeff? <coughs> Well, thank you, Dean Elwood. I'm not sure whether you mean I'm known for the, the, the quality of my slides or the quantity, uh, but in this case, I have kept it to uh, three slides. Uh, I hope to, uh, as is but my... wait till you see those slides. 
to try to uh, set the stage uh, for this panel by uh, uh, reminding uh, us of uh, where we are in the economic crisis and try to say something about how we got that way, although uh, nobody uh, thoroughly understands uh, the economic crisis, despite the title uh, of, the, of the session. Um, the, uh, just uh, to remind you, the subprime mortgage crisis hit in uh, the summer of 2007. And for quite a while, the hope was that it could be, it would be contained, was the, the words that often came reassuringly from the, the Federal Reserve and elsewhere. Well, that turned out uh, not to be the case. And uh, various uh, indicators of economic activity started to go into uh, decline. Uh, the one that is sort of most precise is uh, <laughs> payroll employment, uh, which is illustrated in this graph. The top graph is the total labor force. The middle graph is, uh, is employment, number of jobs. And the bottom graph is the unemployment rate. Payroll employment peaked in December 2007, and since then we have lost about 1.2 million jobs. The unemployment rate in the most recent month available was 6.5% in October. That would be on the, on the payroll basis, and has uh, risen uh, quite a bit from uh, uh, over, over the last year. By the way, tomorrow is uh, the day, the first Friday of the month, is when the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases the uh, numbers for uh, November. And uh, we'll see what those are. Well, uh, as, uh, as Dean Elwood mentioned, uh, I'm a member of the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee. And on a Monday, we made the declaration that, uh, oops, that the recession had started December 2007. That should be uh, one year uh, old. Uh, may maybe a Freudian slip because most people's reaction is, what, only now? A year later, you're uh, announcing it. Um, uh, maybe implying that we took too long. But on the other hand, uh, it, it, maybe, we took, uh, maybe we did it too soon because many people think the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative uh, growth. And we haven't had that yet. But uh, the, the definition, the, the, we have some official status, uh, is what the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee says it is for uh, a recession. And, and we look at a variety of indicators. Greg Mankiw was on this committee for uh, maybe eight years, but it's one of those committees that's good to be on when, when, during an expansion because it never met. Uh, that was uh, during the longest uh, uh, expansion in, uh, in American history uh, in the, uh, in the 19. Uh, 90s. Anyway, the fact that the recession started in December 2007 means that it is already longer than the preceding two recessions, which both were eight months in length. It means that it is also already longer than the average post-war recession, which is 10 months in length. Length. Now, the record is 16 months, which was uh, the two most severe recessions so far, 81, 82, and uh, 70, 1974. Everybody's forecast, and I'm now not speaking uh, as a member of this committee, uh, the, the NBR Business Cycle Dating Committee, but if you look at the forecast,